Ladies and gentlemen, can I, on behalf of Asia House, warmly welcome you on this rather rainy day to a very important item in our calendar. It's always a great privilege to have our very close friends from the Chinese Embassy here. Uh, the Chinese Embassy has been very engaged in the proceedings of Asia House in a number of ways over many years. Uh, and in particular, uh, the ambassador, His Excellency Liu Xiaoming, is a good friend of Asia House, and uh, I have had the great pleasure of uh, sitting on a panel with him not so very long ago where we discussed uh, broader Asian geopolitical issues in a, um, in a conversation which I found uh, absolutely um, uh, rewarding, stimulating, thrilling. So it's a great pleasure, uh, Ambassador, to welcome you back. Uh, the ambassador's uh, going to give us his thoughts in a uh, wide-ranging speech, and he will then take some questions uh, for discussion, and then it will be my privilege to wrap up the uh, session a little later on. But without further ado, may I welcome Your Excellency to the stage. Lord Green, Michael, distinguished guests, members of Asia House, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you, Lord Green, for that kind introduction. I'm no stranger here at Asia House. It has always been a pleasure to come here to share my visions on major issues of common interest. And every visit to Asia House always gave me new inspirations and new thoughts. I'm going to share with you my thoughts about the world we are living today. The world is undergoing profound changes and seen in the century. Changes are punctuated by chaos. Boundaries between populism and nationalism are blurred. Amid surging anti-globalization and rising unilateralism, globalization and multilateralism suffered backlashes. These developments are raising questions about where the world is going. Just as President Xi Jinping said in his speech, at the UN office in Geneva in 2017. What has happened to the world and how should we respond? For me, as a Chinese ambassador in UK, I have another important question before me. That is how to enhance China-UK cooperation in responding to global challenges. Today I would like to share with you my views on these three questions. The first question, what has happened to the world? In my view, the world is facing three main challenges. The first challenge is the development deficit. The world economy is under mounting downward pressure and is showing further uncertainties and instabilities. On top of that, the escalating trade friction triggered by certain countries is dealing a severe blow. IMF has downgraded the outlook for world economic growth to 3.2%, the lowest since the outbreak of the financial crisis in 2008. WTO prediction for this year's trade growth is only 2.6%, even lower than the outlook for the world economic growth. It is true that a new round of scientific and technological revolution has resulted in higher efficiency, but it has also widened the gap between returns on capital, technology, and labor. It has 
exacerbated digital divide. And for many families, the basic necessities of life, such as food, shelter, and jobs, are still out of reach. So cutting the global development deficit remains a daunting task. The second challenge is global governance deficit. In the past century, mankind suffered the scourges of two world wars and endured the dark clouds of the Cold War before establishing a relatively stable international system. Peace has not come easy. It is all the more important that current international order be cherished. However, stability and the certainty have become scare commodities. Searching protectionism and bullying behavior are dealing a heavy blow on international rules, on the multilateral mechanism, and undermining the trust and cooperation between countries of the world. The current international order and governance system are not perfect. They need to be more representative and inclusive in order to give more representation and greater voices to emerging economies and developing countries. This is a serious international governance deficit. Reform and improvement are badly needed. To bring down this deficit, every country must be involved in decision-making process of such reform, including how it should be carried out and what will be the goals. So cutting the global governance deficit remains a thorny issue. The third challenge is peace deficit. With incessant regional conflicts and wars, rampant terrorism, extremism, and surging hot sport issues, the world is far from a peaceful and tranquil place. According to Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, the overall global military expenditure was 1,822 billion US dollars in 2018, which was an increase of 2.6% of the previous year and the highest since the end of the Cold War. Moreover, non-traditional threats to security are mounting. Climate change, cybersecurity, the refugees crisis are not, not only have an impact on our daily life and on regional and global stability, they also have a bearing on the destiny and the future of mankind. So cutting peace deficit also remains a challenging task for all. Now let me turn to the second question. How should we respond to these challenges? Here's China's clear-cut answer. China will always be a contributor to global development, an upholder of international order, and a defender of world peace. First, China provides confidence and impetus for world economy. In a few days, China will celebrate the 70th anniversary of the founding of People's Republic of China. In the past 70 years, China has grown from an impoverished country to the second largest economy in the world. Since 2006, China has contributed around 30% of the growth globally. It is now the world's most important economic powerhouse. China remains one of the fastest growing major economies in the world. In the first half of this year, China's economy grew by 6.3% year on year, which is well within the anticipated range. Foreign trade and foreign investment in China have kept increasing. From January to August, 
import and export reached 2.95 trillion US dollars, increasing by 3.6% year on year. There are about 27,000 newly set up foreign businesses and actual paid in foreign investment total about 89.26 billion US dollars, up by 6.9% 6 year on year. China remains determined and confident in deepening reform and opening the market wider to the world. China has promoted the building of the Belt and Road Initiative. It has signed agreement on BRI cooperation with 166 countries and international organizations. BRI now is the most popular public goods and largest cooperation platform in the world. China is improving its business environment by deepening reforms on individual income tax and the VAT, cutting tax and the lower fees, stepping up IPR protection, and formulating the supporting regulations of the foreign investment law. China is also taking new measures to open wider to the world, including adopting a new negative list for foreign investment, establishing the Shenzhen pilot demonstration area of socialism with the Chinese characteristics, building the new Lingang area of Shanghai Free Trade Zone, and setting up three, setting up free trade pilot zones in six provinces in China. China has a population of close to 1.4 billion, labor forces of 900 million, middle income earners of more than 400 million, market entities of more than 100 million, and well-educated and skilled talented pool of 170 million people. No matter how things may change in the world, China has a confidence in the resilience, the potential, and the prospects of its economy. China will focus firmly on managing its own affairs well. At the same time, China will continue to integrate with the world, promote world development through its own development, and deliver more benefits to the people of all countries. Second, China contributes to the stability and justice of international order. China is one of the founding members of the United Nations. It is a creator, beneficiary, and defender of international order established after the Second World War. China remains firm in upholding the international system with the UN as its core and international order based on international law and the multilateral trade system with the WTO as its core. China has taken an active part in the reform and development of global governance system. It has joined almost all the major intergovernmental international organizations, signed more than 300 international conventions. China has been shut out of the UN for 22 years, but never wavered in its belief in multilateralism. China had spent 15 years in negotiations to resume its contracting party status to general agreement on tariffs and trade and to join the WTO. Despite all the difficulties and crises, China has lived up to its WTO commitments fully and integrated steadfastly with the international order and multilateralism. China is now the second largest contributor to UN regular budget accounting for 12% of the total amount. As the largest developing country, China upholds justice and fairness in the world, safeguards the common interests of all developing countries, and supports 
the efforts of other developing countries to raise their voices and increase their influence in the world. In recent years, as China approaches the center stage in world affairs, the interest in China from the rest of the world has increased exponentially. There are worries that China will challenge the current world order or reinvent the will. There are also talks about a new Cold War between China and the US and predictions that China will fall into the Cicitis trap. But these are all needless worries due to misunderstandings. In our view, global governance should follow the principle of extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefit. China opposes the outdated logic that winner takes all. All strength leads to hegemony. China is not aimed at challenging or replacing any country. It is committed to a new path of state-to-state -state relation that values dialogue about confrontation, partnership above alliance. China should not be blamed for the difficulties in China-US relations in the past two years. We believe that China-US relationship is completely different from US-Soviet Union relationship during the Cold War. The so-called decoupling is not in line with the trend of times, nor does it tally with the fact that the interests of the two countries are deeply intertwined. China does not want conflict or confrontation with the US. China will continue to pursue a China-US relationship that is based on coordination, cooperation, and stability. Third, China shoulders its responsibility for and contributes its wisdom to world peace. China is committed to the path of peaceful development and promotes world peace through its development. At the same time, China advocates that all countries should follow the path of peaceful development. Over the past 70 years since the founding of PRC, China has never launched a single war or conflict. China follows a, de a defense policy that's defensive in nature. It is the only nuclear power in the world to have promised no first use of nuclear weapons. Of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, China has the lowest level of military expenditures, both as a per percentage of GDP and in per capita terms. Its per capita military spending is only one eighteenth of the US and one ninth of the UK. China is also the second largest contributor to the UN peacekeeping budget and the largest contributor of peacekeeping personnel among the permanent members of Security Council. Some 39,000 Chinese peacekeepers are serving in peacekeeping missions all over the world. In Gulf of Aden and off the coast of Somalia, Chinese Navy has carried out escort missions for 10 consecutive years and ensure the safe passage for more than 6,000 ships, including the British merchant vessels. China advocates a new concept, the common, comprehensive, cooperative, sustainable security. This is a concept that embodies China's wisdom. Following this concept, China has engaged in political settlement for regional hotspot issues in a responsible manner. On Iran nuclear issue, China upholds and implements the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. On issue of the Korean Peninsula, China upholds peace and stability by promoting the momentum for dialogue and the easing of tension. 
China has also made a positive contribution to international efforts in addressing non-traditional threats to security. Take climate change, for example. China firmly supports the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and calls for green development. By 2017, it had fulfilled the promise of cutting the carbon emission per unit of GDP by 40 to 50 percent compared with 2005. That means target met three years in advance. China has also been the world's largest in investor in renewable energy in the past 10 years. Moreover, China has set up a South-South Climate Cooperation Fund and injected 20 billion RMB yuan to help other developing countries tackle climate change. Now I would like to turn to the third question. What should we do to enhance China-UK cooperation in responding global challenges? China-UK cooperation is mutually beneficial and joint promising prospects. This year marks the 65th anniversary of China-UK diplomatic relationship at the Sajid Affair level. In the past 65 years, from Sajid Affair level to ambassadorial diplomatic relationship, from smooth handover Hong Kong to establishing the global comprehensive strategic partnership for 21st century, that is the golden era between China and UK, this relationship has achieved remarkable progress despite wind and rain. In 2018, our bilateral trade exceeded 80 billion US dollars for the first time. At the 10th China-UK Economic and Financial Dialogue concluded last June, six nine outcomes were achieved, including Shanghai London Stock Connect, which for the first time connect the Chinese and foreign capital market. Last month, Hengshen Standard Life, a joint venture between Chinese and British companies, became the first enterprise of its kind to receive permission to establish pension insurance company in China. The UK has a larger Chinese student community, more Confucius Institute, and more extensive cooperation with the Chinese universities and schools than any other countries in Europe. There are close to 200,000 Chinese students here in Britain and two million mutual visits between our two countries every year. Against the backdrop of the Brexit, a global Britain will create new opportunities for China and UK. Prime Minister Johnson sent a message of congratulations to the reception I hosted in celebration of the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, he said that China-UK relationship will continue to be important as the UK prepares to leave the EU, and that he wants to be ambitious with a greater trade and investment between our two countries. In responding to the three global challenges, China and UK should join hands in following three aspects. First, China and UK should join hands to promote openness in world economy. China and the UK have complementary strengths in development model, industrial structure, and science, technology, and innovation. We have consensus on supporting free trade and advocating multilateralism. We already have a sound basis for cooperation in areas of trade, investment, and financial services. And we enjoy enormous potential for cooperation in emerging areas such as big data and artificial intelligence. Earlier this year, our two countries signed agreement on cooperation in third markets. This will enable the two countries to work together on Belt and Road Initiative and create new highlights and growth, and growth points in their cooperation. 
Going forward, China and UK should take concrete actions to enhance openness in their cooperation. We should foster a fair, just, transparent, and non-discriminatory business environment for companies of the two countries to make investment and set up businesses. And we could join, we could work together to lead a new round of economic globalization. Second, China and UK should join hand to promote reform in global governance system. Both our two countries are committed to, up, to upholding rule-based multilateralism. Under the new circumstances, our two countries should adopt a global vision, enhance cooperation on international affairs, and advance reform in global governance system. We should jointly make new contribution to world peace, stability, development, and prosperity. In particular, China and UK should stand up against the headwind of protectionism and unilateralism. This is time for us to demonstrate our courage and shoulder historic responsibilities. We should uphold the multilateral trade system with the WTO as its core, and at the same time, promote necessary reform in the WTO to improve its authorities and effectiveness. Third, China and UK should join hand to promote lasting peace and universal security in the world. As permanent members of UN Security Council and important members of state of G20, China and UK should build closer partnership in climate, in climate change, biodiversity, and cybersecurity. We should also keep close communication on regional and international hotspots, such as Iran nuclear issue, and contribute our part to peace in the world and stability in the relevant regions. While enhancing cooperation, China and UK should also handle our differences in proper manner. Our two countries differ in social system, cultural heritage, and development stage. It is natural that we do not always see eye to eye. The key is to respect and understand each other respect each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity, respect each other's core interests and mutual concerns, and refrain from doing anything that will undermine each other's core interests. This is the only way to ensure that our two countries manage, control, and settle differences in a constructive manner. This is the only way to keep China-UK relationship in the right direction. Ladies and gentlemen, let me quote a British saying to wind, to wind up my speech. <laughs> I hope this uh, English, British saying will not scare you. <laughs> that is, a common danger causes common action. In face of the changes and chaos in the world, China and UK, as a major countries of global influence, should shoulder our responsibilities for the history and for all mankind. It is important that we pull in the same direction, come to each other's aid in times of difficulties, and address challenges hand in hand. We have responsibility to answer the questions of our times and contribute our wisdom and strength to building a community with a shared future for mankind and making our world a better and more beautiful place. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lord Green asked me to take questions from the podium. So, Yes, please. Would you also identify yourself so I will know who you are, though I know so many old friends? Uh, Martin Barrow of Maths and Company. Um, thank you for a very positive message uh, on global as well as 
UK-China relationships, you, you stress the importance of being open in all directions. Perhaps you could add a little bit more about the development of the tourism sector in all directions. Obviously, China is the biggest outbound market in the world now, and between the UK and China, there is more to do. For example, having a 10-year reciprocal visa agreement and keeping visas as simple as possible and so on. It'd be interesting to hear your views on how we can do more in that sector. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, tourism is really a new area of collaboration between China and UK, and there's a great potential. Uh, you know, every year there are about uh, uh, 140 million outbound uh, uh, tourists uh, from China. And I, as I said in my presentation, uh, now the mutual visits between our two countries is about uh, 2 million. So one way, so it's less than 1% of the total uh, Chinese people traveling outside China. Um, we encourage more exchanges, um, and I'm very pleased to see that uh, uh, the momentum is getting up. Uh, now, uh, take, for instance, last year, uh, there, are new, uh, there are seven new uh, direct uh, uh, routes uh, between uh, connecting London and cities of China. And now, every week, there are about 165 flights uh, linking our two countries. Um, so every day, there are about 4,000 people traveling between our two countries. But comparing with the uh, United States, uh, with other countries, it's still uh, very small. Um, and now, with regard to the visas, uh, you know, we are very um, uh, uh, welcoming more uh, flexibility, uh, uh, relax relaxation um, uh, of the system. Uh, I'm very pleased to see Mark Field, uh, the former Minister of State is sitting here. Uh, we've been working very actively with the Foreign Office. Uh, there's no problem on part of China. Since I become Chinese ambassador, I've seen more and more uh, favorable um, solutions. Now there's a five-year multiple visas. We certainly would like to have a 10-year uh, multiple, uh, you know, uh, visas. Uh, there's no problem on uh, Chinese part, on, on part of uh, uh, China. Uh, we know there are uh, ten-year multiple visa arrangement between China and the U.S. Uh, I do not see there should be any difficulties uh, between China and the U.K. And uh, uh, the tourists really bring a uh, lot of opportunities uh, to China, U.K including more jobs, um, more uh, contribute Chinese tourists. Not, uh, according to some statistics, they spend more than 10% than, than any other countries. So they contribute uh, enormously to the UK economy. And also they bring uh, closer uh, our two countries. Uh, we are fully, support, uh, fully supportive of tourist cooperation between our two countries. Thank you. One hand there, and then next here. Well, good morning, David King from Spark International. Um, China has historically tried to avoid interfering in the domestic affairs of other countries. As China approaches the center stage of world affairs, do you see China becoming more vocal on issues that disrupt global trade, such as the current Saudi Arabia-Iran situation? Um, China. Um, you know, it's always uh, been uh, the principle of China's foreign policy that we do not interfere into the domestic affairs. Uh, but when it has uh, uh, the policy of a certain country have a, a bearing or impact on international uh, relations on, inter on the regional situation, of course, China will have uh, like to have its voice heard. Uh, but we believe in multilateralism. As I said, we believe in the UN as uh, uh, an international system, as the core of the international system. So we work with the UN. We work with the relevant uh, uh, countries in the region. Uh, we are working for coordinate, concerted efforts. Uh, China will not uh, interfere into the domestic affairs, even when some countries uh, uh, has a problem in their foreign policies. 
Thank you. Yes, one hand there. Uh, good morning, Callum Morrison, Coventry University. Um, we've all heard of, st of the Silk Roads. Um, I'd like to ask a question with regard to the management of technologies that you spoke of. We've all heard of the Silk Roads, but probably most people have not heard that China is a market leader, a world leader, in the technologies of infrastructure and the manufacture of those technologies. But could there could be conceivably a problem in the future in the management of those technologies, as most Chinese students who study in the UK do not study anything other than the service economy and shopping uh, on the internet. Is it time to have a dialogue with the deans of the universities about the reality of the world economy, which is not just services, but also manufacture, technologies, agriculture, and every other part of the economy? Thank you very much. Uh, we certainly welcome opportunities to have a dialogue on uh, not only services, uh, technology, uh, agriculture. Uh, you know, between China and uh, uh, UK, uh, there is a many a mechanism uh, on the government level, uh, on grassroots level, regional, sub regional level, well, sub national level. Um, <coughs> take one take China, UK economic financial dialogue, for example. It's not only about financial uh, affairs. It, ca it has a broader uh, um, uh, you know, a reach uh, to various sectors. Take uh, uh, this 10th uh, economic financial dialogue, for example, uh, when Vice Premier Hu was here last June, uh, we reached six, nine outcomes. I think uh, I cannot remember every item on the six, nine item, uh, but there's a one item, one area which increase China-UK cooperation on agriculture, on manufacturing, uh, technologies. For instance, I happen to be uh, the one who signed uh, an agreement with my counterpart, with the Minister of State from Agriculture Department, uh, an agreement on lifting ban on British beef. You know, you know that being banned on British because of a, a mad cow uh, uh, in, 20, uh, in 1993. So it has been almost 26 years. There's no import of British beef uh, uh, for China. And, uh, uh, but as a result of a constant efforts on both sides, and especially in a uh, the health sector, uh, the quantum uh, uh, sector, so progress has been made. And during the visit, I accompanied the Vice Premier uh, to visit some farms, beef farms, uh, lamb farms, and uh, both uh, he, himself, myself, and the entire de delegation have been very impressed by how British farmers raise cow, and uh, we have a better understanding of a geographical uh, what they call the geographical labeling. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, geographical indicator. indicator. Geogra Thank you, Lord Green. <laughs> Thank you for your help. Thank you for your rescue. Uh, and we are going, and, and there will be a delegation coming here to UK for further discussions uh, with regard to geographical indicator. Uh, there's enormous potential for British. Uh, export to China, including Angus beef, uh, Welsh beef, and uh, you just name it, and uh, 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 Scottish Simon, and the, uh, uh, the First Minister of Scotland always argue with me, uh, Scotland can, you know, offer better salmon than Norway, and uh, I hope Norwegian ambassador is not here in the room. <laughs> so, uh, uh, there's enormous opportunities, and we welcome uh, opportunities for dialogue cross war. Uh, there's uh, many mechanisms uh, uh, in education. Uh, I think the, the mechanism is still active. Uh, that is uh, uh, 50, uh, had, uh, 50 presidents, of, a president of 50 universities between our two countries have this uh, mechanism uh, during uh, high level uh, people to people exchange dialogue. So I hope uh, uh, your, your university uh, will have an active part uh, in it. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Christine Chow, Hermes Investment. You mentioned about um, technology cooperation and AI. In the UK, we have seen um, FCA or the government publishing numerous papers, white papers, for example, recently on AI and personal insurance is one of the first of three parts. Um, should we be expecting more guidance from the Chinese government on AI technologies, providing the framework that businesses need, whether it's Chinese businesses, businesses coming, becoming global, coming out of the country, or global businesses want to operate in China, how they should uh, conduct um, their uh, AI or build AI analytics according to the local framework? Mm. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is yes. We'll see more um, action uh, plans uh, from a Chinese government. You know, the government attaches great importance to the development of uh, AI technology. And also we attach great importance to collaboration, international collaboration. Uh, there's a, um, a very active cooperation between China and UK uh, in AI. And I think two years ago, um, uh, our two countries issued a joint strategy for uh, industrial, creative, and innovation. Uh, this is the first time that China issued such a strategy with a foreign country. So UK is really a leader in this area, and AI is a part of this strategy. And so we look forward for more uh, action plans, uh, more projects between China and UK, and more guidelines from Chinese government with regard to how China uh, will conduct AI uh, projects, how China will engage with the foreign countries in this important area. Thank you. Okay. Hand in the back. Jeremy Grant from PwC. Um, obviously, you mentioned Brexit in your speech, and we live here in the UK on a daily basis with what some might say, regardless of your view domestically of Brexit, it's a bit of a soap opera right now. What is the Chinese view of what is happening in Britain and Brexit? What are your feelings about it? What's the feelings of the, the government, the Chinese people, when you look at this country and what we're going through? Just curious to get your thoughts on that. Uh, we just watch what is going on with great interest. Uh, uh, we hope you will bring it to an end sooner. You know, we like to have more certainties. Um, but of course, it's very much up to the British people, uh, up to the politicians, the UK government decide uh, when to end, how to end. And uh, what we are concerned is the uncertainty. You know, there are about 500 Chinese business operating in UK. And some of them, I think some of them in the room, and some of them set up their Europe, European headquarters in UK. They have reason to be concerned about the prospect of Brexit with deal or without deal. Uh, what will be the impact on their businesses? Some of them already start to have a planning ahead. You know, uh, for instance, some company doing uh, Euro clearance. They are not so sure whether, uh, if there, uh, there will be a Brexit without deal. Can they still handle Euro business here in London, in the city? So they have to prepare ahead. Uh, some of them already set up open new offices, though the main offices, main office still remain here. But they have, they need to uh, plan for the uh, uncertainties. Uh, second, my concern is uh, I do I know most of the politicians are so busy with the Brexit, I don't have much time to focus on other things. I'll give you one example. I as I mentioned. Um, <coughs> in my presentation that I hosted uh, a grand reception at a, at, at a great hall, the Guild Hall of the city, on 9th of uh, September. And we all know what happened on the 9th of September in this country. And we cannot get a minister. You know, uh, my dear friend Mark Field is no more minister, but even he's a minister, he cannot make himself available. You know, none of the ministers can come to my reception to celebrate with us the big celebration, the 70th anniversary of the founding of PRC. And instead, they sent uh, one of the uh, 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 director general of the foreign office. Uh, this is the highest for this highest British official attending my reception. 
and the lowest representation since I become Chinese ambassador in the past nine years. When I had my reception uh, uh, the first year, I have four secretary of state, including Philip Harman, who is the secretary of transportation then, attending my reception. But we fully understand, you know, I've been uh, 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 notified that uh, uh, it, uh, they, they expressed their disappointment, uh, their apology, they could not send the minister because all the MPs have to be in Westminster Hall to vote. Instead, um, Director General read out the message, congratulations from Prime Minister. So we do got something in return for the big occasion. So that shows that because of Brexit, um, the British government is uh, so focused on this single issue, uh, uh, they could not give, they can still, you know, uh, follow other things, but there's uh, some digressing, uh, 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 some uh, uh, disruptions. But what I'm doing is to ensure that relationship will remain strong, our uh, relationship will go ahead, uh, we should, uh, you know, um, make sure that relationship move in the right direction despite Brexit. Because as I said, we believe there's opportunities after Brexit. Uh, so we watch the situation closely. We also try to figure out what will be next. Uh, though it's a, a quite, a, quite a challenging task for me, for my staff, to tell Beijing, to tell Chinese people what is going on uh, uh, you know, in this country. But we, we try to report accurately, objectively. Thank you. Yes, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, it's Mark Wheel, the uh, uh, Look at Me, and uh, uh, an ongoing and long standing friend of the UK China relations, if I can be the Minister of State. And so I won't answer the Brexit question um, other than to say, probably like many of you, I'm appalled by uh, what is happening and what has happened. And uh, may I thank you, Ambassador, for your diplomacy in, uh, in your uh, answer uh, earlier on. All I would say, rather depressingly, is that we are only, as Churchill would say, at the end of the beginning. Of course, uh, whether we have a deal or no deal, uh, we still have to negotiate future arrangements. And I'm afraid that is going to take a lot of time uh, and a lot of energy in the uh, UK, UK Parliament for, uh, I'm afraid, some years to come. Now, I wanted to ask, if I may, a little bit about Hong Kong. Um, uh, an issue close to our hearts. May I say how positive is the news that we heard in the last, last day or so that uh, significant investment is going to be made in housing, which I think is at the core of many of the discontent of some of the young Hong Kong Chinese, certainly from my own experience, on two visits there uh, as a minister over the past two years. Uh, what I would like to know from you, sir, is a little more about how you see Hong Kong uh, integrating with the Greater Bay Area uh, and where you see Hong Kong's future in a post 2047 world. Mm. Um, this is the 22nd uh, uh, year uh, of Hong Kong return to China. Uh, since Hong Kong return, uh, one country, two system policy uh, has been implemented and it achieved enormous success. Uh, fact shows that one country, two systems have been successful. Uh, it will be a guiding principle for Hong Kong uh, in the future, in the days to come. Um, this uh, uh, current situation uh, has been uh, running for three months. Uh, it's no more uh, issue of democracy or no democracy. It's issue about rule of law. And uh, uh, some uh, uh, extremists uh, take advantage, uh, make excuse of exhibition bill uh, you know, to make it uh, anti-government uh, demonstrations. Um, I, we do hope that uh, law will be, uh, law and order will be restored. Uh, we should support the uh, special administration government to implement uh, rule of law, to implement one country, two system, and bring the law maker, uh, the law breakers to justice. Uh, and also, we do hope that foreign countries will respect that Hong Kong is part of China, especially for British politicians do not regard Hong Kong as still as a part of British colonial rule. And uh, uh, I do hope that Hong Kong 
will continue to be a positive uh, in China-UK relations rather than a negative factor. Um, you mentioned about the problem. It's true. Uh, there are problems in Hong Kong. I think the uh, uh, social problem, economic problem, uh, Hong Kong economy too much depends on uh, services, uh, real estate, uh, it's unbalanced development, and uh, young people have uh, not enough opportunities. Uh, I think the central government realized this. Uh, uh, Hong Kong special administration government also realized this. So from what happened uh, in the past uh, three months, I think people uh, have a better understanding. You know, we're separate from young people, um, uh, the peace demonstrators, from extremist elements. You know, we are not uh, 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 blaming all uh, the young people. Um, um, but this problem cannot be resolved by violence, by demonstrations. It can be dealt with, uh, with the, uh, serious, uh, uh, thoughtful measures. You mentioned about the uh, uh, Greater Bay uh, Development Area. It's one of the strategies for uh, central government, you know, to help Hong Kong uh, to uh, seize the opportunities of China's development, to tap the potentials of collaboration uh, between Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangdong. Uh, I believe there's uh, uh, enormous opportunities for the three areas to work together. There'll be more opportunities for the young people uh, I think um, uh, I read some report that uh, many enterprises in Guangdong, the bordering uh, uh, neighbor uh, province on Hong Kong, uh, they are more supportive, uh, active to recruit young people from Hong Kong to offer them more opportunities. I think on, uh, on, uh, in the press conference uh, uh, at the embassy, I gave a uh, uh, a fact, uh, I compare um, the development in Shenzhen, just cross the river, and development in Hong Kong. You know, Shenzhen is a dynamic city. Uh, four years ago, it was a fishing village of 30, uh, around 30 people, 30,000 people. Now it has 20 million people. And all the uh, uh, new uh, startups, uh, Establish their footprints there, and they gradually become uh, big companies like Huawei, like uh, uh, Tencent, Tencent, like Dajiang. You know, during my um, uh, home leave consultation, I paid a visit to Shenzhen. Uh, I was invited by the party secretary and the governor, uh, mayor of Shenzhen, and also the founder of Huawei. You know, to compare notes about their development strategy in UK. And the party secretary had a very interesting line. <clears throat> He's saying, you know, we are just a small city, and this street is a very small, but Americans, they take a challenge. They challenge, you know, all the major Chinese companies are situated in this single street, Huawei, Tencent, and Dajiang. So, you know, what is this about, Ambassador? Would you explain to me? I said, you are so important now, and uh, you are representative of uh, Chinese industries. So right now, there's not a single company like Tencent, Huawei, uh, and Dajiang, this uh, high-end new technology company in Hong Kong. So that really shows uh, what's the uh, uh, problem in Hong Kong. So we do hope that uh, uh, after this uh, uh, development, people would realize that uh, uh, there should be some reform uh, uh, on many sectors, including economic structure, uh, how to uh, create more opportunities. So I believe this Great Bay Area strategy is a, of great importance. Um, you know, it, it, it's not only about service, it, it, it is project, not only about the service uh, uh, sectors, uh, but also the manufacturing, uh, new technologies, uh, high technologies, uh, AI industries, uh, uh, and I, I really believe that, I hope the young people in Hong Kong will seize these opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, Lord Green. <laughs>
Ambassador, thank you. In your uh, presentation, you said that China regards the UN as the cornerstone of global governance. You also said that the WTO is the core of the um, coordination of the international trading system. I would be interested in your comments on the Chinese perspective on two other international institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, um, both from the perspective of what their roles are and how those might evolve, and perhaps importantly on their governance. Uh, we are fully, support, uh, fully supportive of these two institutions. Um, you know, um, when I served in Washington, you know, I served at Washington twice. My last assignment was uh, deputy head of mission. Uh, I worked very closely with uh, World Bank and IMF uh, um, China. It is, uh, I happen to be, you know, I always have some historic uh, 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 occasion. It is during my tour of duty as uh, Sergeant Affairs of the Embassy to sign agreement uh, with the World Bank, the Vice President of World Bank, uh, uh, agreement for China to donate 500,000 US dollars for aid program in Africa. That was the first time that China donate to the World Bank. In the past, before that, it was always China is, China is a recipient of a loan from the World Bank. So the Vice Governor, uh, uh, Vice President, I think Vice President of World Bank said, Minister, I was minister then. This is a historic occasion that China is no more a recipient of World Bank loan. Now China is a contributor. So I think uh, since then, there's, uh, uh, I can't say billions, but hundreds of uh, millions of uh, donation contributes from China. So China has been an active uh, part, uh, active contributor, a participant in World Bank Affairs. Uh, same can be said about IAM. We are fully support uh, of the system. Uh, we believe they uh, have a very effective role, though they are not perfect, like World Bank, in terms of uh, the quota representation. But China is increasing its contribution, and China has a greater share uh, now. I, I count, uh, I, I think it's uh, close to more than 10. Uh, China is. Uh, uh, second now uh, contributor of the world after United States only, just like uh, our status uh, in United Nations in terms of UN budget. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, there. I was uh, remind this will be the last question. I feel honored then. Uh, Ed Rothery from Colliers International. Um, I actually just landed off a plane from Hong Kong this morning. Um, so not the question I'm about, but I would say, obviously the effect of everything that's going on does impact the atmosphere of Hong Kong. And it's, it's, it's very upsetting, really, that you go and you don't get the full cultural experience and the joy of Hong Kong, which is a fantastic place. But anyway, uh, you mentioned about climate change. Obviously, um, China is way ahead of a lot of other, pe a lot of other countries. Um, they've implemented a lot of the current technology and things. Um, are China also planning on taking that technology forward and being a world sort of leader in new climate change technology? And in general, what is the sort of government doing to uh, initiatives to get normal people to sort of change their uh, approach to things? You know, China is very committed to climate change. And uh, our state councillor and minister, foreign minister Wang, uh, represent, uh, uh, he represents President Xi to attend the summit in UN and to show support of this uh, climate change uh, uh, summit. Uh, I think there's uh, several ways China will further, um, uh, you know, commit it. First, we will fully implement our promises, um, you know, uh, uh, to the Paris Agreement. And there's uh, a very comprehensive action plan in China. I. I uh, I tend to uh, use example of uh, uh, during the reform of Chinese government, the structure of the Chinese government, several minist ministries have been abolished and some have been merged. The only ministry that has been strengthened and elevated 
you know, from the Bureau to a ministry level is a Ministry of Environmental Protection. So that, and I, that's, that's not uh, the end of the story. Um, the, uh, and also, this ministry has been given enormous power to enforce the law uh, of environmental protection. That means, uh, you know, in, on the provincial level, there are always a uh, bureau uh, for environmental protection in the past. But in the past, the, uh, the director of uh, this bureau for environmental protection is appointed by provincial governor. You know, they are uh, responsible uh, uh, to the governor of a province. You know, if there's a problem, uh, an environmental uh, uh, serious disaster, a polluted a pollution, you know, if a, government, a governor has an uh, opinion, it'd be very difficult for a director of uh, the Bureau of Environment Protection uh, to have a different views. You know, I work as assistant governor uh, in Gansu, um, one of the uh, poorest provinces since my ambassadorship in, uh, in Egypt. So I understand how the local government function. So it's not an effective uh, mechanism. But now things change. It's for the Ministry of Environment and Protection to point directly the director of the Bureau of Environmental Protection. They are not responsible to the local government, to provincial governor. They are responsible to the central government. That means they can challenge the local authority if they violate the laws of environmental protection. So that will make this uh, system uh, more effective. But that shows determination of the central government. And also President Xi, he himself is very much committed to climate change, to environmental protection. You know, he traveled uh, many places. Lately, he traveled to the uh, uh, Yellow River area. You know, he always his idea that uh, China should be not focused on greater development, rather a greater plan for development, rather than greater plan for protection. And, um, uh, uh, and also uh, his uh, theory that um, uh, how to translate in English is uh, um, gold mountain, silver mountain is not as good as a green mountain. Uh, that's exactly, you know, you have to, and also uh, in the past we always, uh, uh, our strategy to develop China is to turn China into a uh, modernized, prosperous, uh, uh, culturally advanced uh, um, a country. Now we add another concept uh, to make China uh, uh, a prosperous, uh, culturally advanced uh, uh, country, but also a beautiful country that means green, to make China more green. And it's also part of a strategy, uh, a, a green strategy for Belt and Road Industry. We're building a green uh, belt and road. People have some concern about the infrastructure uh, relating to Belt and Road, uh, more coal burning, more construction. Uh, but the, now we are uh, uh, committed to build Belt and Road more uh, uh, greener, make it more greener. So there will be more restrictions on the project uh, with regard to Belt and Road. It has to live up to the standard of environmental protection. Also, also uh, to uh, m more efforts have been made uh, by the government to raise awareness of the public awareness of environmental protection. That is also very important. So it's across the country, cross board, from the very top to uh, the very down the grass, uh, grassroots. Uh, the people, every uh, citizen have to have awareness of the, the importance of the environment and also the businesses, you know, and also the local government. In the past, uh, local government uh, uh, will be uh, uh, assessed uh, with regard to their performance, mainly by GDP, how fast economy grows. Now, environmental factor is one of the very important indicators of their performance as a, you know, government officials. So um, that's for uh, the domestic government. Internationally, we're committed uh, to our promise. We work very closely 
uh, with the other countries, including UK. So environment, climate change is always a very important part of our conversation, conversation between Chinese and the UK government. Thank you. Ambassador, you have given us a, a, a marvelous tour d'horizon in your presentation of the um, relationships between China and the world at large. You've covered a lot of topics, um, uh, both domestic and international. Uh, and then you've taken questions on all sorts of aspects of, uh, uh, of China's engagement with the rest of the world and inevitably on both Hong Kong and on the UK. Uh, you've answered them fully and thoughtfully. Uh, you have done us a real uh, uh, favor. It's a great privilege for us to have uh, heard your thoughts uh, on behalf of a country which is quite plainly um, uh, one of the two most important countries that we need to have good relationships with for the foreseeable future. Uh, you are always welcome here, as you know, um, and I would like to thank you both personally and on behalf of Asia House and on behalf of uh, our uh, audience today for the time that you have taken to be with us. I should just perhaps finally, on behalf of Asia House, uh, promote the fact, since Hong Kong did come up, that we are holding our next conference in uh, Asia, in Hong Kong, at the end of next month. Uh, in the stock exchange. The subject will be uh, the global trade order, a, a theme that we have been uh, promoting and talking about now in several of our conferences recently. Uh, we're going to have a really good lineup of speakers, and the fact that we're in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, um, I think, is symbolic of our belief of, on the continuing importance of Hong Kong internationally as part of a network of financial centers, uh, one other of which, of course, is right here in London. So. Uh, uh, anybody who happens to be in Hong Kong on uh, October the 30th is very welcome. Um, and in general, once again, thank you so much for your uh, thoughts this morning. Uh, you have been a uh, uh, honored guest here several times. I look forward to uh, future occasions um, uh, for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you.